Hey there, and welcome to part five of chapter four in microbiology. And here, we're, this is a real quick lecture just to talk about detection and measurement of growth. In part three, we talked about how to um, grow bacteria in the laboratory and the different requirements and all of that. So now we're just going to, we've grown this bacteria in the laboratory. We've been successful at it because we took care of all of our considerations. So now we're going to look um, at how to detect and measure growth. And growth is measured in either a viable or um, uh, direct uh, type of form. So we have direct uh, detection of growth and we have a, what's called a, a viable count. Okay. And in direct cell counts, we're going to count cells directly. So the first way and the most uh, probably one of the oldest, most old fashioned ways of doing it is with a hemocytometer. Uh, this is the same type of tool that is used in blood counts. If you're doing a blood count, uh, like a, a red blood cell count or a white cell count, uh, that would be done with a hemocytometer under the microscope. And you have to use some calculations and dilution factors. You literally physically count the number of cells under the microscope in a little grid. And then from there, you use the calculations to uh, figure out how many bacteria are in a sample. Nowadays, they use instrumentation. Now, there are two different types. There's what's called a Coulter counter and a flow cytometer. The Coulter counter counts cells in suspension, but cannot differentiate between uh, dead cells, living cells, uh, host cells, uh, mixed samples. So the Coulter counter is really great for getting a general cell count, but it doesn't tell the difference between any of those different cell types. Nowadays, in the diagnostic laboratories in particular, and in many research laboratories, we use what's called a flow cytometer, which takes the same concept. This is a Coulter counter over here, sometimes referred to as a cell counter. And so this Coulter, Coulter was the name of the company that built these. Uh, so this Coulter counter over here is, again, just really just telling us how many cells. But now with a flow cytometer, which is what we're looking at here, in a flow cytometer, the cells are stained. So different cells are stained different colors. And instead of moving in front of a, a general light source, these different stained cells will move past a laser beam. Now, both a culture counter and a flow cytometer use the same concept of a liquid sample. And the liquid sample goes through a funnel that eventually becomes so narrow at the end that only cells can, cells can only pass, these bacterial cells can only pass in single file. And this is important to be able to count. And so as these cells move past this laser beam, their different colors are going to uh, bounce off different colors from the laser beam. And the laser beam will be able to count. And then a computer will actually count how many blue cells, how many red cells, how many black cells. And then we can take a look at that data. And we can not only get a general cell count, but we can actually differentiate which cells um, are, are moving past in that, that flow cytometer. Now, viable cell counts include living cells only. So remember, bacteria have these cell walls that uh, if they are to die, oftentimes they'll go through plasmolysis inside of that cell wall, and we won't be able to see the cells as dead. So in a direct cell count, we're not able to differentiate between a living cell and a dead cell. But if we use viable cell counts, then we can. And in industry and in the environmental industry, uh, in water testing, in the food industry, in the medical device and sterilization industry, viable cell counts are incredibly important because dead cells don't cause disease, living cells do. Um, so we need to make sure in, in many different industries where microbiology is involved, uh, we want to test using a viable cell count method. And in this, we include in the viable cell count method, the first thing that's usually done is what's called a serial dilution. And the serial dilution is a standard way of diluting, you know, a large sample. I don't want to count how many bacteria are in uh, 10 milliliters of lake water. We're talking in the billions there. I can't, I can't count that high. So I dilute my sample down systematically. It's called a tenfold. I dilute it systematically so that I have some dilution factors. I'll use those dilution factors with my cell count later on to calculate how get an estimate of how many bacteria are in my original sample. So this will require some type of plate count. That's what it's called, a viable plate count. Sometimes it's called a standard plate count. You will complete one of these through lab, right? So this is a standard plate count. 
and it usually again uses these dilutions. There's another method called the MPN or most probable number and this is an estimate of concentration based on statistics and dilutions. And then we have what's called the membrane filtration method where we would take one of these dilutions and we would run it, uh, Looks, this is a membrane filtration uh, uh, type of mechanism here and what you have is on top of this filter, this is the membrane right here, we would have a large cup. The cup's been removed in this picture, but there would be a large cup here and it would be filled with say one milliliter of solution that's being tested. This, it'll be pulled through a vacuum. Down here is a vacuum. And the water gets pulled through the vacuum through this filter paper right here. And what this, this uh, person is doing is they're aseptically removing the filter paper from that membrane filtration device and they're going to lay it down in an agar plate. Now it's a methyl cellulose filter. It has a specific pore size to allow water molecules to move through but to keep bacterial cells behind. These bacterial cells get trapped on the filter paper and then when this incredibly thin and fragile filter paper gets laid down on top of a, a petri plate with agar, it will soak up the agar and nutrients and the bacteria will then be able to grow. And so what they're looking for here, this is a coliform test and these large greenish silvery type uh, microorganisms are living coliforms that are being, um, being observed. And so this particular agar, like this is a non-coliform, non-coliform, but these big bright uh, goldish looking ones are, these are all coliforms. And so now the scientist, uh, this uh, technician or scientist can come in and say, okay, there's this many uh, uh, what we call colonies. And this is based on what's known as the CFU model. So they would say, okay, there's uh, 72 CFU on this plate. Uh, and that would be colony forming units. And with a colony forming unit, we are simply assuming that each colony arises from a single bacterial cell. So when I did this um, uh, filtration, I left behind 72 bacterial cells. That's what CFU is basically saying. So uh, viable cell counts do involve a little bit of math and they oftentimes take a little time because we have to, of course, let the bacteria grow and we also have to go through these dilutions. Now, um, biomass is really kind of a growth versus no growth. We don't have a true mathematical number of the amount of cells, but we can use some mathematical or some um, instrumentation to give us a general idea in comparison. So first we can um, do it by growth or no growth. And when we have uh, a broth is normally very clear, like we have on the left, so this is clear. And this is cloudy, or also known as turbid. And so in biomass, we can um, record cultures as growth versus no growth, right? So this is negative for growth. This is positive for growth, because this one's cloudy. If we want to be more specific and, and start comparing growth of one uh, broth or one culture to growth of another, we can use something called a spectrophotometer. This is an instrument that's used to measure the absorbance of light as light is passing through a culture. So the, the more turbid or the more cloudy the broth um, is, this is used with broth cultures, the cloudier the broth is, the more cells we have in there, the greater the growth of the bacteria. So the higher the absorbance reading, the greater the amount of bacteria in that culture. Does that number tell us exactly how many are in there? No, it does not because it's an indirect cell count. It does not tell us if they're living or dead. It doesn't even tell us what kind. It just tell us, tells us that there's a whole lot of bacteria in this culture, but not so much in this one. The last uh, biomass assumption is total dry weight. This is reserved mainly for very large concentrations of filamentous organisms where we take the known weight of a single cell and then we um, divide the total dry weight of a population uh, uh, by that known and that'll give us a general idea of how many cells. This is used a lot for uh, cyanobacteria, um, algae, those sorts of organisms. Then we look at some cell products. Uh, sometimes we want to know, we want to use the metabolic property of an organism to be able to identify it. So we look at different cellular metabolic pathways that bacteria prokaryotic organisms use. Uh, so this will be considered um, observation of cell products. Here in the top left, this is an uh, aerotolerance test and I can see my bacteria here is producing cracks in the agar, 
all down in here, and this is due to CO2 production. This right here is a broth culture, so we put a small test tube upside down to observe for fermentation. I trapped some of that CO2 gas in here, and again, I can show that this is uh, CO2 from fermentation. So this would be acid and gas production. This test here is called a phenol red test. We add pH indicators to media in order to cause color changes if fermentation is occurring because fermentation in bacteria results in acid waste. So I can use a pH indicator to see if my environment is getting acid because those, weight, those acidic waste products from fermentation are being released. Another just kind of cool one is this ATP release. So uh, this is um, a way of doing of using cell products to complete a viable cell count. In this case, luciferase um, is, a, is an enzyme that is added to a sample of living cells. So you'd add it to a broth and then we plate that broth and we put it under UV light and under UV light organisms that are going to use luciferase, they, they actually absorb it. Those cells that are alive will absorb it and under UV light they glow. So I can use luciferase to give me to you to promote cell products that will um, tell me give me a viable cell count. So here are just a couple of questions that um, at the end of this that you definitely want to ask yourself. It's just a way to review the lecture throughout all four sections of it. We've gone through four parts of it here. Um, and I'd just like you to kind of ask yourself these questions. Uh, use these as review questions to go through the lecture again. Make sure you're able to answer these. Uh, these are the types of things that you might see um, or concepts that you may see on your exam. So I hope you enjoyed chapter, uh, chapter four here. This is a really fascinating chapter, learning about microbial growth and what they need to grow. And I look forward to seeing you in chapter five. See you soon.